Winter mushroom foraging in the UK. We're out on a mushroom hunt in one of the best mushroom foraging locations in West Sussex. So let's go and take a look and see what fungi we can find today. Our first fungi. These ones here are velvet shanks. These are a nice size. We've got a few around there. And this is quite a nice tree. A few sp sprouting up through here as well. I can see, you might not be able to see it through here. We'll go take a look in a minute, but there's another good tree over there with a, uh, a whole cluster of velvet shanks on, even more than this one. But these ones are a really nice size and velvet shanks, in my opinion, are a relatively easy identification. I pick one here. So they get their name because they have this lovely velvety looking stipe. There's no skirt on them as well. And that is a feature you want to be able to recognize to distinguish them from um, the funeral bell. I, I don't think you should confuse velvet shanks for the funeral bell because the stipe is so distinct on them uh, but for novice foragers it's one that you would want to be aware of if you haven't seen or identified a funeral bell go take a look at my sheaf wood tuft video where I show you how to identify a sheaf wood tuft and distinguish them from the funeral bell there's some good footage in there of funeral bells at the velvet shank their, their gills are nice and pale they've got pale uh, spores as well unlike the funeral bell which have rusty brown spores so over time the gills will go rusty brown on the funeral bell um, whereas with the velvet shanks they stay nice and pale these ones are a really nice size i don't often come across them this big you find them growing in clusters this tree here i presume is a dead oak quite a few more up the tree Let's gather up a few of these velvet shanks and get these in our basket, see what else we can go find. Another tree through here with velvet shanks all over it. This will be another little oak. I've gone a tad brown. So in my opinion, these are a little bit past their best. And I'm going to leave these ones behind. The ones lower down, you can see. So when they're at that stage, they're, they're past their best. The original ones we found a moment ago were in very nice condition, nice and young and fresh. The next species of fungi you want to be looking out for in January in the winter in the UK is just down here. These ones are called scarlet elf cups. There's actually two species, the ruby elf cup and the scarlet elf cup. Um, they're indistinguishable without microscopy. They're both edible. The ruby elf cup is much more rare than the actual scarlet elf cup. So generally people are going to find the scarlet elf cup. These ones down here are teeny. So I'm going to leave these ones today and I won't be harvesting them and just let them grow and flourish. These are a really easy identification. In my view, there's nothing you should be confusing scarlet elf cups with. Uh, they're, they're red cup fungi. There's nothing else that actually looks like these. And you're going to find them on windfall, generally on hazel uh, windfall. And I usually find them on calcareous soils. Seldom have I seen them when I'm on acidic soil. So you're looking for hazel, hazel trees, hazel copses on calcareous soils and uh, check around on the windfall, the dead branches. Sometimes you can find them in large numbers and um, these are a nice little addition to your plate to brighten them up. Next on our winter mushroom forage, we've got jelly ears. Another really easy identification. You're going to find these on elder. They grow pretty much exclusively on elder trees. Dead, dying, living. Usually you'll find them on the dead branches. And they get their name jelly ears because they're 
got a texture, a little bit like jelly, and they look like ears as well. If you do use them in the kitchen, if you're using them in a frying pan, uh, you might need goggles because they tend to pop quite a bit. Um, my favourite way to eat these is to deep fry them in batter and have a nice, a nice sauce with it or create some salt and pepper chilli jelly ears for example. Uh, they're one of my favourite ways to eat these. You find them in quite large clusters, particularly if it's been raining frequently. We've got some on this branch just here and then up there. There's loads more up there, really nice size ones. This is a good example of why they get their name Jelly Ears. You're going to find these all year round, they're not exclusively found in winter. Um, in my experience, Season can be quite a weak identifier for fungi, so if you are looking for fungi, seasonality generally is really low on the list in terms of um, narrowing down your identification. Um, fungi are very unpredictable, they go by their own fickle calendar and you can almost find anything um, at any time of the year. As long as the environmental conditions are right, they need warmth and moisture. So as long as the right environmental conditions are there, the fungi will potentially be there as well. Um, but with jelly ears, you can find them in the winter, in the spring, summer, if we've had lots of heavy rain, uh, the autumn as well, you find them all year round. Next, we've got one of the most popular uh, winter fungi to be foraging for. Typically, I don't usually find them again in the depths of winter. Uh, like we are now, but because it's been so mild, uh, it's a bit of an anomaly. These ones are winter chanterelles, Craterellus tubiformis. Now, with these chanterelles, all chanterelles, what the distinguishing feature is with those is that they have false gills. Uh, they've got high manium or wrinkles rather than two, true gills. And once you can recognise those, you'll be able to recognise almost any chanterelle, you'll be able to put it within the either Cantharellus or Craterellus genus. These are a nice little find down here. So I can see there's a few. I'm going to gather myself a few of these. Um, these again, they're really easy to identify. They have a depression in the centre and sometimes they're called yellow leg or yellow foot because they've got a yellow stipe, false gills and in my view there's not really anything you should be confusing these for. Uh, you have Craterellus tubiformis which these most likely are and then you also have Craterellus lutescens uh, which looks remarkably similar, very hard to distinguish between the two, but they're both edibles, all chanterelles are edibles. So as long as you know you're in the chanterelle genus, they're good to go. They're good to be used as food, consumed as food. This down here is a classic chanterelle patch, nice and mossy. Usual kind of habitat you're going to find chanterelles in. The Craterellus genus, and which has about half a dozen species within it. They're all saprobic, they're believed to be saprobic, uh, saprotrophic, which means they feed on decaying matter, whereas the Cantharellus genus are all believed to be mycorrhizal. And I do find the winter chanterelles, members of the Craterellus species, typically around decaying wood. So where I am right now, there's a, a tree stump Underneath all this moss, there's lots of decaying wood, so this is the ideal habitat for them. It's believed, some people might say that chanterelles, they have um, a relationship with moss because you often find them with moss. However, moss is a non-vascular um, plant, so for them to be mycorrhizal, for example, or have a relationship with moss, they would need to be exchanging nutrients and minerals in some way and um, moss being a non-vascular plant, um, there's no real way for the 
fungi to be breaking down nutrients and uh, connecting to like a root system and the moss to be transporting that around its vascular system because it doesn't have one. But I just believe that they both thrive in the same environments, in the same type of habitats with the same uh, degree of decayed matter. Um, I can't see personally how moss and chanterelles would have a, a mutualistic relationship or a mycorrhizal relationship because it hasn't got a vascular system. But that is going to be it today for our winter mushroom forage and I hope that this is going to be useful to you when you're out on your walks hunting for mushrooms yourself at this time of year.